the reason why I became a theorist is not is because I'm so bad at uh, technical things that every time I walk I walked into a lab, lots of things just stopped working. I didn't have to touch anything, they just stopped working. So I decided that it would be best to stay away from experiment and maybe I wouldn't be able to do so much harm being a theorist. So anyway, let, let me tell you the sto a story of how this all happened or how it started. I started life, um, well, a bit later than started, but I, I was a graduate student in Oxford University studying high energy physics, sort of field theory. Then I ended up as a postdoc in Torino, Italy for a year where I continued doing complicated calculations for very little return. And I got sort of tired of it. So then I didn't get a I tried to get a job at CERN, but because I was uh, I'm somewhat lazy and badly organized, I failed to submit my paperwork in a timely fashion. And so I missed the apt opportunity. Then I had to apply for not look for another job, and my wife, I was at, in Torino at the time, my wife walked down to the station, she could actually walk that far in those days, and bought an English newspaper where, remember this is long before the days of the internet and so on, and bought an, a newspaper where there were some job adverts. And so we looked through that and found a couple, so I applied, applied for them. And ended up being offered a, a long-term postdoc at Birmingham. So I was a bit disappointed in all this because I didn't really know much about Birmingham University. I wanted to go to CERN, which is the place for high energy physics. And but actually this, uh, uh, this, this, this little episode was actually a turning point because at Birmingham I did uh, continue this calculations that I've been playing with um, and, and I got really fed up so I was wandering around the department talking to people asking if they had some tractable problem that maybe I could work on. So I found myself in the office of David Thowlis and I was standing there listening to him going on about all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas like superfluidity, vortices, uh, dislocations and crystals and so on and so forth and his ideas were more than slightly unconventional but I was approaching this from a standpoint of very strong ignorance I, mean, I knew nothing about condensed matter and so it all, it sort of all made sense to me so I went and you know worked on it a bit and they came up with, with some ideas and actually did some calculations seemed to work. And so when I went back to talk to Thales, he said, okay, that, this makes sense, let's uh, write it up. So we did, and I suppose you could say the rest is history. But my, and that was actually the work which, for which we, Dave and I are being honored uh, by this Nobel Prize. It's amazing to think that was my first attempt at doing anything in condens condensed matter physics. But then, of course, if you think a bit further, as your president just said, sometimes it's a g good idea to, to, go, uh, to come into something without any preconceived ideas. I, 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 the, I call this conventional wisdom with a slightly uh, denigrating sort of um, tone, but often a lot of conventional wisdom in science is not necessarily wrong, but often doesn't get you anywhere. Because in any branch of science, there are a lot of very smart people. And these smart people have reached a uh, sort of plateau and are just can't get, don't seem to be able to get any further, going, you know, sort of going round and round in circles. And what it needs is some, somebody coming in from left field with something, some completely new crazy ideas, and if they're very lucky, these new crazy ideas actually work. And this is what happened 
uh, in this particular case. Now, about these words, topological. Well, okay. This word was invented mostly by David Thales, not by me, because I wouldn't know a topology if it sat up and barked at the time. And so, uh, my own understanding of these, this topology all came from drawing pretty pictures, or actually my, with my art, artistry, not so pretty. And I spent a long time drawing things in bits of paper, doing elaborate calculations, which under more normal circumstances I would have uh, simply given up on because they were more than slightly tedious. But I was sort of motivated because the ideas underlying the, you know, of, of the dislocations, the vortices, the topological excitations seemed to make sense and seemed to you know, have a chance of leading somewhere. So I was very motivated to, to do all the calculations. I mean, you know, I was sitting with, uh, in, a, in, in, my, in an office or a, a room in my, in, at home with filling up, bit, you know, paper after paper after paper and throwing the waste paper basket till eventually I got somewhere. So I thought I'd uh, start with explaining a little bit about what these topological excitations are and, what, and the motivation uh, for, for doing this. Let's see now, is this right? Oh yeah. Okay, so this was in the early 1970s, uh, some, some years, a uh, number of years ago, almost 50 years ago now. And the situation in the 1970s about um, phase transition of two-dimensional systems is essentially summarized here. And of course, we concentrated on magnetic mo models simply because a lot of magnetic models can be mapped into uh, real physical systems. And so the, the, uh, the, the model I started, looked at was simply this ferromagnetic model where the energy divided by his usual Boltzmann factor, KT, is some constant or some temperature dependent thing which I call K times that other factor in the, in the brackets where these SIs, S's, uh, spins if you like, lie in lattice, you know, square lattice, triangle lattice, I don't care. And it's an N component spin. You know, the Ising model, you've got, uh, is one component, the planar rotor model, n equals 2, and so on and so forth. And there was a lot of, at the time, a lot of controversy about this set of models. And the situation was that, of course, for n equals 1, that's the Ising model. That means S is, say, the S is up either plus 1 or minus 1, say. And this is the Ising model. And there was an exact solution for the due to Onsager and we know what happens in two dimensions of phase transition with, you know, for the standard exponents are known and so on. However, nothing was known about if there were more than one component. For example, uh, there's a gr groups of people were working on all sorts of Monte Carlo simulations in, in these systems and high temperature seas expansions. And these... To these numerical methods seem to indicate the following. They looked at various, you know, spin systems, you know, always with, uh, say, the fixed length, fixed length of the spin being, say, one, doesn't matter. And the conclusion was if a two component spin, that's the planar rotor or XY model, at n equals two, maybe there's a transition. You know, the, the numerics weren't good enough, but it looked like something happened. And then equal, if you higher uh, number of spin components, n equals three is a Heisenberg model, and n equals four, and so on and so forth, uh, the numerical results said that there probably was not a finite temperature transition. And certainly, 
uh, if you took n going to the number of components to infinity, you, what you're talking about is a so-called exactly soluble spherical model, and that's definitely no. There is no transition in two dimensions. However, this case of n equals 2, which is clearly, um, you know, then, then that uh, energy is just like the, the spin can be uh, parameterized by an angle. And what you get is you get this a thing that looks like k times 1 minus cosine theta i minus theta j, you know, the angle difference between near, near, nearest neighbor sites. And so that was the model we started working on because it seemed this was a peculiar one, which was really uncertain. OK, so uh, Thalus and I started looking at this problem. And of course, another part of the motivation yeah, was experiment. If you take this spin system with two components, then actually what you, this is equivalent to the, the problem of a statistical mechanics of, a, of where you've got a complex field, uh, e to the i theta, say, on each site and with nearest neighbor interactions. And this is exactly uh, the, uh, the, the, the situation for superfluid helium. And so there are some, and there were a, lot of ex, a few experiments existing with helium-4 films. And this is some of the data you see. I'm uh, sorry, uh, this is, so what, what, you, what this is experiment's about is you have a, have a helium film absorbed on the surface of a uh, resonant crystal. And so you set the crystal vibrating, and you look at the response of this absorbed film. And so this, uh, they measured the, the change in the frequency, the resonant frequency of the crystal as a function basically of, uh, of coverage of the amount of, amount of liquid helium absorbed, absorbed on the surface. And if it was just ordinary fluid, like water, then what would happen, these are very thin films, and so, clearly, if you have an ordinary fluid absorbed on the surface of uh, a crystal that's vibrating, the, the, the fluid will move with the crystal, right? It won't, it won't, it won't, uh, it has to, you know, but it's really, it's very thin, so it's a, it will be locked to the surface of the crystal, which is vibrating. And so all this does is it increases the mass of this vibrating crystal, therefore affect the frequency, the resonant frequency. And the straight line is the, uh, the, 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 the um, prediction for such a situation. You know, it's just a linear increase in mass of the crystal as a function of coverage. And for low coverages, you notice that the data seems to go on to this straight line, so all this stuff, is, all this uh, helium is locked to, the, to this oscillating substrate. And then as you put more on, I mean, this should be, this is basically uh, 1 over log of the pressure divided with some reference pressure, which is a measure of the coverage. I'm sorry, it just got cut off uh, with my, my I very inexpert construction of uh, PowerPoint slides. And then as the coverage increases, but at, and at, fixed temp at low temperatures, you notice that suddenly the data breaks away from the straight line. In other words, this discrepancy with the straight line and the actual experimental data is a measure of the amount of fluid that is decoupled from the vibrating crystal. Okay, and now think about a superfluid. Suppose you put some superfluid to a vibrating crystal then you would expect the superfluid simply doesn't vibrate with the crystal. And that's exactly what you see here. So in other words, this, now this is a very thin film. So I mean, I don't know how you want to describe it. If you describe it as a thickness, you could say that it's, 
less than a monolayer, or maybe a monolayer, a monolayer and a half of stuff absorbed on, on, the, on the surface of the crystal. And so this, this uh, discrepancy between the, uh, the straight line and this, uh, uh, the experimental data is a measure of the amount of fluid that is decoupled from the crystal. And you have to interpret that as, as a measure of the, of the amount of superfluid. OK, so in other words, but this film should be described by that simple model I wrote down. In fact, it can be shown to be that it works with uh, two component spins. In other words, it looks like, like this n equals 2 situation. There is a phase transition where you get the onset of superfluidity as a function of coverage about here. So now, this is, as I said, is contrary to any rigorous theorems because rigorous theorems say that this doesn't happen. But clearly, something does happen experimentally. Then there's another bit, another bit of experimental data which is basically the same sort of data. And here we've got, uh, if you like, this is a, if you like, it's a plot. If you convert that data into uh, superfluid density, the density here I mean mass per unit area, right? It's two dimensional, versus the total, the, the total coverage density. So this is a total density of fluid absorbed and this is the density of superfluid. And you notice that um, eventually something... So here you... you the, the amount of superfluid is, is... So there's basically no superfluid fraction. And then suddenly, at some coverage, it sort of rises up rather, rather quickly. So again, there's another piece of experimental data we're talking, this is data from, see, when is, this is Chester and Com et al, and this was published in 1973, which is about the time we started working on this problem. So there's another piece of data that needs explaining. Uh, those numbers there, you know, the 1.69, etc., those are temperature. These experiments are done at constant temperature. So that, that data and the numerical work is a, was a motivation for looking at this, at this problem. Something seemed to be happening, seemed to be some sort of transition in two-dimensional systems in complete contradiction to the accepted uh, wisdom from the uh, new rigorous, rigorous, the rigorous theorems, the Merman-Wagner theorem and stuff like that. Okay, so this is how we looked at the planar rotor model. We, you know, we parameterize the spins by an angle the spin makes with some arbitrary axis. And if you like, you can write it in terms of some complex um, field, the so-called psi, which is just the x component of the spin plus i times the y component. So you can write that as uh, some, something, the length of the spin times e to the i theta. And if you like, you, you can call this the, the order parameter or whatever you wish to call it. And so the order parameter is, which is psi, which is a complex field, is its magnitude times, times a phase, times e to the i times a phase. And notice this is invariant under if, the, if you simply let theta become, add a multiple of 2 pi to this angle. I mean, it's obvious because e to the 2 pi i times a multiple of, of 2 pi is just 1. And so it is variant under the angle goes to, the, it's the angle plus some integer multiple of 2 pi. And, of course, this, these statements imply that there's a topology uh, in this, of the system. And the topology, of course, is a torus. 
And the so-called global or topological excitations are these things you all, we all knew about before, uh, are so-called vortices in, in superfluid helium. And these are simply parameterized by the integral of the angle around some contour, let's call it C, is, has to be multiple of 2 pi. Okay, so that you can call a, this integer n as the vor vorticity enclosed by this contour C. Okay, that's fine. It, you know, it's a bit of, bit of mathematics. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you very much. And then Dave and I sort of decided, okay, now the trick is to uh, think about a system, a large system, with an isolated vortex. And ask the question, okay, in thermal equilibrium, are there any isolated vortices in the system? And it's a very simple calculation. You just simply look at the energy of an isolated vortex, uh, let's say a, a, a vortex of, of unit circulation, in a system of size L. And there's some, of course, you end up with some logarithm. And of course, the argument of the logarithm must be something dimensionless. And so you simply say, OK, we'll divide it by A, some microscopic. So L is the length of the size of the system, and A is some microscopic length scale, like a lattice spacing or uh, inter interatomic sort of spacing, something like that. But of course, the logarithmic scale doesn't make much difference what you use. OK, so that's the energy, energy where this J is just the um, exchange constant. The, I mean, the nearest neighbor uh, coupling energy. And then you need to calculate the entropy of such a vortex, because after all, statistical, you don't use statistical mechanics. And the, 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 uh, the rule of statistical mechanics is what you do is you calculate the free energy of, of the system and the probability of such a, of a particular configuration with free energy, so F or something, E minus the temperature times entropy. So we need the entropy, which is simply, as you well know, or you, if you don't know by this stage, you should know, is simply some Boltzmann's constant with the right appropriate uh, dimensions times the logarithm of the number of possibilities. And what we're looking at here, system size L, which is an area L squared, and the microscopic area is clearly the, is my, the square root of the microscopic length. So this is the uh, is logarithm of L squared over A squared is clearly the number of possibilities. And so the free energy of, is the energy minus en temperature times entropy. So you, OK, so and you say the probability of of this isolated vortex is just e to the minus, sorry, this beta, which is one over kt, times the free energy. And the free energy is, the free energy is it, the energy we calculate minus entropy times temperature. So we've got the energy, we've got the entropy. And so you, calc you look at this thing. And as you know, the exponential logarithm is whatever the argument of the logarithms is to the, is to the is the coefficient, and you simply get L over A to the minus pi K minus 2. Remember, this K is just the, uh, if in, the in, in a ferromagnet, it's just the exchange constant divided by, by temperature. And now what this means, of course, since the L over A goes to infinity in the, in the, in the, in the thermodynamic limit, the probability of getting an isolated vortex, if this pi k is greater than 2 and on low temperatures, then this bracket is positive and something basically infinite to the power of something negative is 0. Okay? So if, if at low temperatures, you might have the situation of pi k is greater than 2. And if you increase the temperature, so pi k is less than 2, then this thing becomes, 
something positive, so this uh, pi k minus 2 is negative, so therefore this, you get this thing to a positive exponent. And of course, I, I have missed out the normalizing factor. And so basically, in such a situation, the probability for creating a vortex becomes 1. In other words, a vortex, this isolated vortex will be create, will, will exist, will be there. And then you ask the question, OK, what does this mean? So what? Well, think about it physically for a moment. You have this system. And now, if you have an array of vortices, free vortices, in a magnetic system, it's clear that these vortices mean that the, the spins are all, say, pointing in a circle around, around some central point, and it's a global excitation. So, or if, or they may be all pointing towards the, the point or something like that. But anyway, it means in the magnetic system, the system is a, is a mess. In other words, you could identify this situation, the lower one, as a disorder, as, as, the, as a big, representing a disordered system. And the upper situation means that there are none of these excitations present. And you could say that this is a, an ordered system. Of course, now in a magnetic system, this does not mean that you have a, you have a, a magnetization, but uh, you still can have, but all it means is you've got a system without any vortices, and you know how to, you know, at least you should know, how to describe this. But in any event, this, when this thing in this bracket here goes from positive to negative, it means that the system should go from an ordered state into a disordered state. And now, that was the first calculation that we did. And then, of course, we realized that, after thinking about it a bit, if you could replace this parameter k, which appears in the expression, in the microscopic expression, by some for a normalized uh, value, uh, you know, which takes account of all the interactions in, in, in the system, then this formula would still be, this formula would still work, except this would, this k would be replaced by some renormalized value. Uh, of course, calculating that renormalized value, that's, uh, that's a different matter. Now let's turn to experiment. Okay, we, you, you, we have this idea that in this two-dimensional, any classical two-component system, there should be a transition. But this transition is not just that of your common or garden variety. There should, but still, there should be a low temperature phase where you're, you, the spins, if you like, allow to undergo small deviations from the, from the, the ground state uh, position. But that's enough. Those small deviations are enough to say that there's no long-range order or no magnetization, which is completely, which is what the Merman-Wagner theorem, rigorous theorem says, but that's all it says. Then at higher temperatures, so, so really the question now ar arose, okay, arises, we've taken account of small deviations from the ordered state. But these don't do anything. The, the, these, these sorts of excitations can't induce a phase transition. And so clearly something else is needed, and we after doing some calculation with these uh, global excitations, these or topological excitations, um, th that should, you know, th then we could see that something could well happen at a particular temperature. So then came some experiments on, this was done by jo Dave, David Bishop and John Reppy back in 
in the late later 70s and this is their this is sort of the data for the uh, superfluid on helium films for the superfluid density and you see that the superfluid density this is this is this curve here plunge seems to plunge to zero at some temperature and the other curve is the, is the dissipation of course equilibrium statistical mechanics can't say anything about dissipation but now remember helium liquid helium is that a helium film is the perfect representation uh, physical re uh, realization of our model but then you have to ask the question but remember all the predictions of we make on this model are equilibrium the static predictions and uh, so that we can't so we can't discuss the experiments because the experiments on helium have to be done dynamically you know you have to uh, say vibrate it's, it's a bit like this crystal film where you vibrate the crystal and you look at the response of the fluid it's always done at finite frequencies which requires a so-called dynamical theory the theory and then you will get some dissipation and this big peak there is how the dissipation suddenly jumps up from a smaller value to a large value around where the superfluid density plunges to zero. So there is a, some evidence or fairly compelling evidence in a thin film of, of helium. Actually, it's quite interesting because the, 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 heli the thin film of helium is actually absorbed on a piece of plastic, a plastic sheet called mylar. And then the sheet is wound round a, um, a rod, and you're measuring the res a resonant angular frequency of that, of that setup. And this is the, this is the data. And that's a, that's a very strong support for uh, a, a more detailed theory, which I'm not going to uh, uh, bore you with. This dotted thing, the, the, the detailed theory predicts the superfluid density to be that dotted line, which then, surprisingly enough, crashes to zero. Okay, so there should be some discontinuity in this uh, uh, the superfluid mass area. And you're sort of asking, well, oh, this, this sounds crazy. So remember that these sorts of discontinuities normally uh, mean there's a first order transition going on. Whereas the transition we're talking about is a, is a, is a very strange continuous transition. So there was some problem about uh, for, for the community to accept that there could be a, in the static limit, there could be a could be a discontinuity in this quantity. However, as uh, an extension of, of our theory to to take account of the of a finite frequency, the, those are the solid lines, and they're pretty good fit to the data. Not perfect, but, but not bad. So the evidence seems to be building up that, in fact, we, uh, our theory might have some, something correct to say. Here's some other experimental data. This is a compilation of lots of different experiments and how the superfluid density behaves as a function of, 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 of temperature, uh, at least how the superfluid density at just below the critical temperature divided by the, as a function of the critical temperature. Our theory says that this rho s divided by Tc should be a constant. 
And our theory can actually predict what this numerical, what this constant is. And here is the, ex the experimental data, which was incidentally uh, obtained before the theory, before the, actually, before the uh, authors of this theory actually uh, knew about, knew about our David's, work, David's work and my work. So here's the, how the experimental pieces of experimental data this fit. The solid line is our prediction from static theory, okay, which is a simple straight line. And this, the data from different experiments are all scattered fairly closely about that line. So this is actually very strong evidence and support of, of the theory. And so, to me, such, uh, such, uh, such, uh, such data is essentially a confirmation because I can't imagine an incorrect theory fitting the data this well. Maybe that's... Okay, this is, this is, this is a bit of theory. And you see the theory says that if you plot the superfluid density uh, uh, in terms of, say, you know, aerial superfluid density, in terms of uh, gr you know, grams per square centimeter or something like that, uh, sorry, it's been cut off here. This is a, a temperature on the, on the lower axis increasing in that direction. And what theory says is that the superfluid density should essentially look like these below TC should look like those solid lines. And notice that they're basically flat until you get a small region from TC and suddenly you crash downwards onto this straight line. And this straight line, its slope can be calculated as it is exactly 3.49, well, the third decimal place be 491 times 10 to the minus 9 grams per centimeter squared per degree Kelvin. Uh, this is the theoretical prediction, uh, <coughs> which, because you can express in terms of some uh, fundamental quantities like Planck's constant, mass of, the mass of the helium atom, and stuff like that. So all those, all those quantities are known exactly, and so the theoretical prediction for this uh, slope of the, the superfluid density versus the temperature at the critical, at the, at the, at the critical temperature it, is it looks exactly like this. And below the critical temperature, the superfluid density is essentially constant until it crashes down with a small, um, to that, that line with a small, uh, actually, to be technical, the square root singularity, but that's a uh, small detail. And you can see this stuff in another paper of Bishop and Repi in 19, 1980. So actually, all the work, okay, so the, 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 the theory was produced in 1972, 73, and 74, and the experimental verification in helium was done in 1978 or so. And of course, another thing one wants to calculate in any um, uh, statistical mechanical th uh, uh, calculation or any experiment, you'd like to know what the specific heat is. Because after all, if you're an experimentalist, the simplest thing to measure is actually the specific heat, because the specific heat you don't need to understand anything about your system. You don't need to know any, any of the physics underlying your system. And all you have to do is measure the, the, the energy of the, of the system, the change over a small temperature range, and divide one by the other. You know, CV is D, you know, DE by DT. And uh, as we all know, you can write a derivative, derivative as one is not is quite actually quite simple. 
It's just one small quantity divided by another small quantity. So you, but you don't need to know anything else about your system. I mean, if you want to measure, if you want to understand helium films, you have to, under, you know, you have to understand about the superfluid density, blah, blah, blah. And that needs understanding a lot of the physics. And so normally, one would simply plunge ahead and measure some of the specific heat. But in this particular case, you know, at a phase transition, we all learned that the specific heat has some sort of singularity, it diverges in many cases, or does something funny at the phase transition. Well, here, in this particular case, uh, the specific heat does nothing. The solid line uh, is basically uh, the specific heat. This is the temperature going this way. So we see that the critical temperature is actually here. The transition temperature is actually here. But the maximum of the specific heat is well above, is about here. Okay? So there was a huge, the, the, this maximum of the specific heat is not telling us anything about the existence or otherwise of a phase transition. And so that's, uh, that's, another, that's another problem with th this whole thing. Now, okay, the, the talk was entitled Topological Excitations. In helium, Helium films, the topological excitations are these vortices. And the only, what happens with these vortices is that if you take a walk, if you say that the vortex has a, you can regard it as a point, which is the center of the vortex. And then the, the liquid, the fluid is circulating around this point like this. And it, like water going down a, down a plug hole. If, you know, if you're having a bath and you pull the, pull the plug out, you see that the water goes down the plug hole by swirling round and round in a vortex. Of course, the only quantum mechanics we're using here is that these vort in the superfluid, these vortices are quantized. And so our, top and our topological singularities are these these vortices where the phase of the order parameter uh, as you walk around the, the center of the vortex changes by a multiple of 2 pi. Now we can think about uh, another example, crystals in two dimensions. A little bit difficult to realize experimentally, but now it has been done. And so we ought to talk a little bit, uh, no, perhaps we'll talk of, of, for five minutes about the theory. And crystals are a bit, two dimensional crystals are a bit different. There are two types of order in a crystal. There's the translational order, you know, a crystal is supposed to have a translational order, so you know one atom in the crystal is, you know where all the others are. But the, Another important uh, thing about a, a crystal in two dimensions is that it has a set of uh, crystal axes. In a, in a triangular lattice, it's got six crystal axes, uh, 60 degrees apart, or otherwise known as pi over 3. And so my crystal axis should, look some, should be parameterized by some angle theta which is a deviation from pi over 3. And so we can say that there's an orientational order parameter which measures the orientation of the crystal axis, which is e to the just 6i theta, because every time this angle theta goes to pi over 3, we get 60 degrees, if you wish, you get back to the same, what you started with. So it must be of this form here. And so you can, again, with a bit of work, you can formulate the theory of this. The topological singularity, the topological excitations you're talking about for melting, 
that, that are responsible for the destruction of translational order, these are dislocations. Now, you imagine a dislocation where you take, draw your crystal lattice on a piece of uh, you know, a rubber sheet or something, and a dislocation, you, you simply cut out uh, one uh, crystal uh, line of, crystal, of, of, of atoms and then glue your rubber sheet back together again. And that is a dislocation, and you can work out the elastic energy in such a, in such a defect. And the other uh, order in crystals is the orientational order, and a way of in introducing a orientational uh, defect is to simply, okay, in a crystal, your axes are, are six degrees apart. So all you do is imagine you've got this, this crystal drawn in an elastic sheet, then you cut out a 60 degree segment of this elastic sheet, and then glue the two, two edges together again. And that is a, what is called a, disc, disc, a disclination. Of course, the elastic energy of such a, such, a quant, such, a, such a defect is huge. And so you'd say that, that at, this can't affect the melting, and that's correct, because the thing which melts a two-dimensional crystal is you take a pair of, dis, of dislocations of, of equal and opposite Burgers vector and simply pull them apart and if these dislocations are, f are so-called free, if they're bound together, they do don't do anything. But if, they, if you can make them free, or alternatively, you've got two isolated dislocations in your system, then this would correspond to a loss of translation order, exactly the same way as a single vortex in a superfluid. And so exactly the same mathematics and ideas hold for the dislocations. So you get a melting of a two-dimensional crystal via the proliferation of these dislocations. <clears throat> and this theory, actually, uh, you can verify this experimentally. Of course, verifying experimentally took, a, took a slightly longer, and this was actually done, started in about the year 2000, and the measurements went on, between, done between 1999 and 2007, by, mostly by a French group. And, of course, to me, not surprisingly, but perhaps surprisingly to most other people, the experiments in theory agree in quantitative detail. And so one could say that the theory of based and the theory based on these these dislocations and disclinations uh, and experiment agree in, in basically all quantitative details. I don't have time to, to go any further and so perhaps I should uh, let me just point out that Thales and I are respons essentially responsible for the uh, superfluid helium stuff, but we certainly weren't responsible for the theory of uh, melting of two-dimensional crystals, uh, simply because, well, Thales wasn't so interested, and, and I just couldn't do it. It was too complicated for me. So, uh, what this was eventually done by uh, Halperin and Nelson. <coughs> Halperin, uh, Nelson Interesting story, Nelson, I met David Nelson at Cornell in 1974 when he was just a young graduate student. But he was clearly, he was clearly destined for great things because he was obviously a very, very smart graduate student and sure enough, you've probably heard his name in many, in many, <coughs> uh, for many contributions to physics. So, I've been, been lucky enough that lots of uh, 
very smart people have worked on the, this pro the, these two-dimensional problems of transitions driven by topological excitations. And the theory worked out in detail and all sorts of predictions made, which have been, as I said, have been finally been verified in quantitative detail by experiment. So it looks as if the theory and ideas behind it are probably correct. And I've run out of time. I've gone way over time, so I better stop there. And I'll, I'm willing to try to answer whatever questions I may be asked. Thank you. Oh, sure it did, because uh, it started after I had a long conversation with David Thaulis in his office, um, where he was talking about some very strange ideas about uh, top, top, topological excitations, vortices and, dis and, and dislocations, and so it sort of made sense to me. And so, uh, with his ideas, I grabbed his ideas and, and tried to do some calculations. And sure enough, they worked out. So, all this work was essentially done while, while I was still in Birmingham. Well, I haven't applied these ideas to much more than what I've, what I've told you about, because uh, mostly because I'm getting a bit, bit long in the tooth now, so I, I, I have to leave all these developments to younger people. And so I'm really not, really not aware of many other applications of the theory, of course, except to uh, things like uh, cold atom. Uh, there's some nice experiments on cold a using cold atoms. Dimensional systems uh, by trapping them between, with lasers. And even there, our theory seems to explain quite a lot of the data. So uh, I guess the theory makes sense even there. Superconductivity is another uh, place, superconducting films is another place where the theory is applicable with some major modifications. And it seems to, there's a lot of, lot of experiments done on those, and it's, the theory seems to work quite well. What was your opinion on the papers by Beresinski? Beresinski, sorry, I forgot to mention those, because uh, certainly he, he was, had the ideas, I suppose, a few months before we did, because we did read his, some of his, his papers, and certainly uh, he had the right ideas, but unfortunately he never pushed them beyond uh, a rather rudimentary form. The, 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 the real advance that David and I made was we managed to turn those ideas into a quantitative theory. But since he was getting there, but he never, never quite made it. And then he, then he died, unfortunately. Yeah, so you showed uh, expressions for the energy and the entropy of a vortex, but did you actually calculate the partition function? Uh, is, is it possible for, the, for that model? Well, sort of. I formulated the uh, some uh, so-called renormalization treatment by using the partition, by the most complicated way known to mankind, by using the expression for the partition function. I didn't mention it because it's a, a horrendously complicated uh, expression, which uh, 
one has to stare at for a long time before one can make any sense of it. I did use that expression, but to actually calculate the partition function, forget it. It's, it's, you know, it's hopeless. Uh, what I've been taught in my basic statistical mechanics classes is that uh, the existence of a two-dimensional crystal is actually forbidden by the Merman-Wagner theorem. Now, uh, is there a naive explanation uh, for the way out of that? I think so. First thing is the Merman-Wagner theorem only refers to translational order. Okay, picture. Imagine you take. But the, but the crystal is more than just the, the, the ordering of atoms. It's more that the more important thing about a crystal is that if you try to you know, compress it or shear it, you, you get a, a, fi, you know, a, good, a response to that, a finite shear modulus and a finite um, bulk modulus. And so to, from our point of view, it's that those quantities which define a crystal, especially the shear mo you, that a, a, a real crystal, I mean, a non-imitation crystal should have a finite shear modulus. It's analogous to the superfluid density in a film, in a helium film. And so if you concentrate on those ideas, everything just goes through, you get this, uh, you know, same sort of transition as in the helium film, a discontinuity in the renormalized shear modulus at the transition, and so on. So everything actually goes through in a one-to-one -one correspondence, but the mathematics is infinitely more complicated. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much again. At this